experiencing God. This isn't just a series. This is an objective. What, uh, what does it matter? I mean, you believe in God, wonderful. But if you have no experience of him, so what? What's your Christianity if you have no experience? How do we get to experience God? What's the lifestyle that lets that happen? What are the principles involved? What if we could? What if we really could experience God? This experiencing God um, is a study primarily from Henry Blackaby, a great theologian, a great pastor, really, and a, and a great studier of the word. And as I said, this is something that has stuck with us. This is time proven. So I, I believe in this series and this study and what it says. And it's all based on some very simple realities. And we build on them as we go. And we start with this one simple reality. You cannot stay the way you are and go with God. You cannot stay the way you are and go with God. Well, what exactly does that mean? Now, I've looked forward to this. I was planning all week to do this, is to ambush Ron. Yeah, Ron didn't know, but it's going to ask him to help me out. Are you ready, Ron? No, he's not ready because I didn't ask. Okay. Well, you're going to like this, Ron, because I'm going to ask you to come up here and be God. Yeah, come on right up here and be God for me, if you would. Yeah. No problem. Here he is. Oh, well, he's even got the thing, because the next thing I was going to ask Ron was... Uh, I want you to actually pull a pose for me too, Ron, a God pose, whatever it comes to mind. Pose as God for me, if you would. <laughs> that, is, that is really scary. That, that that's is, the God head. Oh, that's the God head. Okay. <laughs> All right, Ron. But pull some kind of a pose that you can, that, that would be godly. Okay. Well, that's very close. I had Brenda do this in the early one. She was like, here. She had higher hands, but okay. All right. Uh, go ahead, Ron. I'm going to ask you to hold that pose for a minute. Okay, here he is. Here's God. Right? This is how God looks. Now, we know there's a word at theologically speaking. You're going to be like this for a long time, Ron. Just let you know. Theologic, the word is immutable. And it means God is not changing. God never changes. The nature of God never changes. And sometimes I think we confuse what this means. Because does that really mean God never changes in any way at all? In our faith, a lot of times, that's the way we practice it, is that I become aware of Ron, God Ron, here is our illustration, and, and, and I, I decide that, yes, I believe in God, and, and I move myself into a comfortable distance with God, and I say, oh, so this is how God postures himself in the world. And so I posture myself like God, so here I am, don't I look like God? You know, here we are. And that's fine if God never changes in any way at all. But what? What if God doesn't change in nature, but he changes where he's working? And he changes how he's working? And he changes who he's connecting with at that time? How does that change things? Well, let's see in a practical form. Now, Ron, as God, now you are going to go and work somewhere else. You're going to be somewhere. So I want you to go somewhere in the room uh, and change posture and, and position. Okay, he's really going all, okay. God has decided to work with Rita Bedwell. Uh, yeah, I don't know that. Either she's a great person or she's just a terrible sinner. I don't know, but God's working with her. Now, but here's the thing. There's God over there in a new posture, working in a new place, but I'm still here like when I first met God. Here I am. I still look like God, don't I? Well, not really, because God doesn't look like this anymore. I'm still close to God, right? Well, not really. God's moved on to something else. He's changed where he's working in the world. Now, Debbie, I'll give her kudos on this. Said, well, God is omnipresent. So I thought about this, Debbie. You had an effect. So God's working everywhere. Well, the truth is God is everywhere. But you know what? God really isn't working everywhere. He is everywhere and control everything. But there are places where he is working more than other places. And I don't even know all the places but if I was paying attention, at least I would know in my life, God is working over here with Rita. 
So here I am. Am I still as close to God as I used to be? No. Do I look as much like God? Am I postured as God as much as I had been? No. The whole thing has changed. What must I do to stay as close to God as I was? Follow him. Ah, so basic, right? I need to, and that will come in. If you didn't see, Ron was doing this. <laughs> and I want you to remember that. Ron, the, the, this may sound like heresy, but you were a very good God. So I, I thank you, Ron. Go sit down and be a regular sinner again. There is a whole mentality that we just set up in this. Why do churches look like they're still in 1950 sometimes? Or why is it that as we follow God, we haven't changed since we first met him? Maybe it comes down to the mentality of the way we see things because you know what? The nature of God doesn't change, but where God is working does. It has always been the way. That's nothing new. I'll take you into the Old Testament. Isaiah, some uh, 2,800 years ago, said this. Isaiah speaking, the prophet speaking as or for God, 4319. I am going to do a guess what? brand new thing. I'm going to do a brand new thing. I am no longer going to be here like this, as, as God Ron had been. See, I have already begun. Don't you see it? I will make a road through the wilderness of the world for my people to go home and create rivers for them in the desert. God's doing a brand new thing. He was moving if we wanted to stay with him, we had to move with him. We had to follow. So you see, even if, you're, even if you've gone through the point of salvation, even if you have been in a relationship with God, the maxim still holds. You cannot stay the way you are and go with God. You cannot stay the way you are and go with God because God moves. God moves. <laughs> The, um, it was uh, a little tough getting things switched around, but the Saturday is a pre-service, as I said, on purpose. And so we already had the first Saturday, uh, and those who made it, we looked at seven basic realities, and we had a chance to explore them more on Saturday, but I, uh, I'm going to give them to you, convey them to you anyway, and it's uh, something for you to know. Uh, in these uh, basic realities, they are this. God is always at work around you. God is always at work around you. That alone, that alone can change your Christian experience. I know for me it was revolutionary. Well, God's out there. God's doing things. No, no. God's at work all around you. God is up to something all around you. Oh, the possibilities that God is working around me. Especially when I think of number two, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you. Not on and off, not on Sundays, not on every third or fourth Sunday, a continuing, continual relationship with you. Number three starts making a whole lot of sense then. God invites you to become involved with him in his work. God invites you to come and be involved with him in his work. See, Ron was way ahead of the game because when he was over at Rita, he did this. God invites you to come where he's working. Well, how do you know? Well, number four, reality. God speaks by the Holy Spirit, Scripture, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself his purposes, and his ways. Number five starts sounding not so cool. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads to a crisis of belief. Wow, this is starting to not sound real fun, right? Well, number six is even, mm, tag, tag it on to that. You must make major adjustments to join God. You must make major adjustments to join God. Seven gets us to the payoff. You come to know God by experience as you obey in what he accomplishes through you. Knowing and experience go together. 
Knowing and experience go together. You know that anyway. If you're married to someone, you know them better than anyone else because you've experienced more with that person. It's no different with God. As we experience, we know him better. We know him deeper. We know him in a more real way. But to experience him, it involves obeying. It involves obeying. So we could get pretty excited about this, probably till we get down to that uh, number five, and, and it talks about a crisis of belief. This uh, doesn't sound like much fun at all. The idea of making major changes doesn't sound like much fun either. And like anything else that we have to put effort in and maybe a little pain, what's the payoff? And it's fair to ask that. It's not being unpious. It's being practical. God, if I do this stuff, what's the payoff? Uh, what's in it? Well, let's consider a few of the people in Scripture that did follow along. And they set up how we're going to build our model here. Abraham followed Moses, the Apostle Paul, countless others through the ages. Maybe you even know somebody who say, you know what? I believe that person experienced God. I believe they, had, they are in a life experience with God. Is it worth it for those people? Abraham, the reason you are sitting here today is in large part due to what he did in his day, some nearly 4,000 years ago. That's a pretty good legacy, isn't it? Moses, we could say the same thing. Paul, we could say the same thing. So we're going to take a peek through how this seven realities work in your life and my life. Let's bring it down into something a little more where we live. And we're going to use it uh, in regards to titles. And we'll start with, uh, with these little diagrams, starting with this one. God is always at work around you. God's doing something. Whether you know it or not, he's busy. And he's busy around you in some way, whether we realize it or not. This in itself is revolutionary. It's not part of the culture in general. Now, because of what we know through science and different things, we think, well, there are systems and consequences to the systems. There is a universe that works because of relativity and quantum mechanics and gravitation and all of this. There's an ecosystem. Things live in, in uh, certain ways and, and all of this going on. There are always these material consequences, we might say. Some people got as far as the watchmaker theory that, you know what? God set it all in motion, but then he walked away. It all works. So he just set it in motion, wound the watch, and walked away. But that's not what Scripture says. If you take the Bible as a whole, it says, no. God works through all these things in these systems, but he's very much still in the picture. He's still very much doing things. And so the question becomes, what's he doing around us? Do we have the sensitivity if you went back to the picture when I was with Ron, if I was not diligent, I was just here all admiring you out there, Ron walked away uh, and he did his God thing somewhere else, I was oblivious. Or I could be very diligent, it's nice you're in the room, but I was keeping a close eye on Ron, and when he moved, I was in a position to know he moved, and then it became whether I wanted to move or not. But are we sensitive enough to realize once we can believe God is at work around us, are we sensitive enough to see it? Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. There's a qualification in there. There's no half measures in this. If we're just doing it to be good church people, forget it. It won't work. We will not reach our objective of experiencing God. Belief, sure. Experiencing, no. In the same regard, if we do, there are certain promises made. Now, if I come here and I, and I worship and I, and I do all I can, God doesn't promise me a new Cadillac by next week. God doesn't say the pain in my leg will necessarily go away. The promises, he may do things like that if he so desires, but the promise is this, is this he will hear me, and when I seek him, I will find him. 
The promise is, I will have an experience with him. That's the promise that goes on, but the qualification with all my heart. I'd like to back up on something a little bit here that I think even in this church, uh, I'm remiss to point this out enough. In the New Testament, there are steps, and there are in that the first step of things, Romans 10 tells us how we begin this relationship with God when we come into the picture. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession, confession to, uh, made to salvation. For the scripture says whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There's the promise. But did you catch the intentionality? We don't just drift into a relationship with God. We aren't born into a relationship with God. Your parents are super saints, wonderful. That doesn't make you one. Your parents then have the relationship, not you. Or in some cases, the child does and the parents don't. But the relationship starts with something very intentional. There is confession and there's belief. There is the interchange, but it, that isn't the whole picture. That's not the whole, if you want to call it, I, I remiss to say, but formula, the process. There is the public confession. There's a change inside, and then there's the public confession. There is the saying to the world, you know, I am standing up and saying not only internally, but externally, yes, Jesus is Lord, not, not just I believe he's God, but that he is in fact Lord of my life.